Go on. I'm sorry. We as adults, we use painting and also as an expression when we don't have words for feelings that we're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Not, so that's all. Well, you know, I think I think that's very true. I think the um, I think that's a really good point. I think the a, a big reason why we make images to, is to get to know sides of ourselves that we couldn't otherwise get to know. I and will tell you that and share that I work with multiply disabled individuals and we have a facilitated arts program. So if anybody's interested, I can share that information at another time. I don't want to take a lot of class time up with this, but we do help these totally disabled people um, create art using actual artists as their hands and as their eyes and and but all of the options come from the individual the per person who has the disability and they're just using the artist as their tool if you will to create these amazing pieces that are being shown in galleries and in museums all over and uh, it's really pretty incredible what this does for the our population self-esteem and sense of self-worth it's just amazing art is just a tremendous vehicle for so much in terms of it's almost uh, like there needs to be a, an art studio at the white house for any, <laughs> anyone there to have a compulsory class every day to help them connect to something deeper perhaps Right. <laughs> you exactly. could also guess yeah. what would be on their paper or the canvas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dose of LSD, too. Uh, <laughs> Microdosing. Micro <laughs> Microdosing. Yeah. I think they need more with micro. Yeah. Macro. Macro, <laughs> macro yeah. Maybe in JFK's time there was, but who knows about it now. But anyway, I'm going to dive in. Um, <laughs> I came out of the studio, like I was painting today and it wasn't going very well. So, um, and I was just thinking about um, how other artists come up with structure because I didn't seem to be able to come up with a way to make a whole, you know, to get a whole bunch of areas to, to work together. And so I came up and just started like looking at, looking for images. And so the first one I found was this Caravaggio um, the deposition, um, and just was just looking at how he um, puts this sort of almost like a staircase of forms traveling up from the bottom left, mm -hmm. forward in space until there's this big boom in the top right hand corner, mm -hmm. like a celebration. So it starts out seemingly, um, you know, there's that little plant which replete, which echoes the the fan of the hands um, down the bottom left hand corner. So the fan of the hands isn't isolated in that way, but it, there's, a, there's a, um, an arc to the flow of the forms as they go up each to each level. Like, you know, when you go climbing a mountain and you go up to a little, up to a little sort of horizontal part and you have a rest and you climb a bit and you have a rest, and you climb a bit, sort of like that. And- um, Cookie. What's that? Wow. Anyway, um, and the way and the comp and the way how complex all that is, like the triangles he puts inside of it, and this, you know, very amazing shape in here, and then how this shape is like the upside down echo of that shape. So there's all these sort of connections through the composition, and how, you know this hand appears from somewhere like I don't even know whose hand it is. Um, and he does things like breaks the space. So he'll have that. He has the hand there just going over the edge. Um, and then he does, Caravaggio always does this. He does strange things like little, little things that confuse the space for me. So like that finger and then this edge, which is receding, but that's the one that's the edge with the light. And then this edge coming forward, and that's the dark edge. And so this is going way back in space, yet he has, so these feet I'm presuming are, are going, and everything's going back in space therefore, and these feet are therefore going back in space, but somehow they're almost flat. 
they're reading flat in space, as are the two hands. And I see this often, he'll, instead of what is sort of correct, if you're thinking perspectively, is to shift the hands like that. But he doesn't do that, he's keeping them horizontal. And there's lots of horizontals. And then lots of forms that make bigger shapes. So there's a big triangle here through the composition. Lot, like, lots of triangles moving through the composition and this negative shape in here, like wonderful negative shapes. And then the, his use of the fabric with this tension at, at that point there where the hands really rip into the flesh, like the fingers push right into that rib cage, you know, and it's, it's sort of the contrast of that versus that, like the delicate touch against the stone obviously has something to do with the narrative, but also it reinforces the, the um, vul vulnerability of the flesh um, of, of a uh, you know, human being. So then I looked at this painting by Matisse. For some reason that painting made evoked this one. This is um, Dance with Nasturtiums 2. On Nasturtiums with Dance 2, I think it is, other way around. And um, you all know this painting? Ari, you know this painting? Yeah, we talked about it on um, Tuesday. The other night? We talked about this one? Yeah. Um, this was, so that's, that's a... Um, we talked about these before? Or just this image? Um, didn't we talk about... I don't remember. About you I don't remember know. seeing this. I don't no. think we've uh, talked I don't, about I don't this think one. So I'm, I'm oh, okay. No, okay. I don't um, think. Yeah, this. So this is a painting, the dance, which is in the MoMA and in um, Moscow. Sorry, Saint Petersburg. And the way he's put it together, somehow made me think of this painting, or the other way around. Actually, this this explosion coming forward in space, this build up, build up, build up, and then that somehow made me think of this for some reason, this explosion, maybe this coming forward. Um, but the way he's got this big triangle again, uh, similar in a way to Caravaggio and these, these different other linkings of shapes and then implications of going back into space and then flattening the space. This dialogue of the surface geometry and the spatial geometry, but things lining up like the verticals, very important points, not in the center of the painting, the center of the painting is sort of roughly here, but he's got this, the, the which is special, um, interestingly, because you've got that blue, that little bit of violet, that gorgeous green next to the pink. So very special moment around the center there. Interesting how he put that green there, right? Because if you're painting the figures pretty much with the orange or a version of orange, to put that green in there is a bit of a bit of a shock because sometimes he's putting he's got the blue coming in to set helps like that's a bizarre thing it feels like a horse for some reason that part there explain that how is that connected to that nina it doesn't feel like it right so maybe at one point the leg did come down here and he's had to shift it so you know maybe his painting we could, if we were to really analyze his dance dance to painting and it doesn't feel like this at all by the way um it is five figures dancing around but they're all very different and i don't remember it being so horizontal at the top and it's definitely not with this shape there this this um rectangle as a negative shape i don't remember that but i do get a sense that the figures perhaps were moving in a different way and he's had to find a, a, an arrangement that works for this other conception of an idea. Um, this is David Park. And this is a um, boy with a flute. That's the flute. And uh, again, I was thinking about how he, how this comes way forward in space, this explosion coming at you in space. Um, 
but also intrigued by the what he does with his negative shapes. Maybe the head was much bigger at one point, and he said to really work the the space around that to find the correct scale, like to shift, because that hand feels big compared to the head, right? Maybe too big if you think of it. If you think of what we think of as hands and heads. But in terms of a painting, maybe it's just right. Except uh, maybe he, he's exaggerating how far, how much closer the hand is in making it bigger. Do you think? So, yeah, so when, uh, a, an old friend, a, a really old friend of mine, Vita Peterson, she, she was a good friend of Mercedes Matter and, and, she, and I, she became like my surrogate mother here in New York when I was an art student. And then for the next sort of 13 years, I'd go and visit her on the Upper East Side four times a, a, a year. And we became very close. We make artwork together and collage together. Anyway, she died a few years back and her daughter said at her memorial that um, her, sorry, her granddaughter said at her memorial that her grandmother, Vita, taught her, she remembers a lot about when she taught her to draw and she was having trouble making space. And Vita told her, well, space is easy. You just make the thing you want to be closer, bigger. Mm -hmm. So maybe David Park's doing that. And she was like, you know, and it always works. <laughs> and it sort of does, you know. This is um, uh, Cezanne from uh, the Barnes collection, Bibimus which was a quarry he painted a lot. And, you know, it's intrigues me how he finds these structures. Like he'll, he's painting a quarry. So clearly it's spatially complex and there's lots of forms that are almost impercept, imperceptible in terms of, or indecipherable in terms of what they are. But somehow he makes sense of that and he doesn't make sense of it by caricaturing any one form even the even that big rock he lets the temperature evoke the the massiveness of that form so he's letting warm and cool do its job but he's basically bringing it all together with that great big idea for structure and this shattered glass sort of geometry that's running through it with a bunch of triangles hidden in there. Here's the steps again that Caravaggio was using. Moving through, up the composition. Peter, who did you say the artist was? Cezanne. Cezanne, that's what I thought. Thank Cezanne. you. Done in like um, 95, I think, around about then. So this is a similar palette as almost the palette that David Park was using. Cezanne used the same palette, but different intensities, you may note. Um, and this is Picasso, um, a man leaning on a table done in 1916. And it's a big painting. I'm, I've been obsessed with this painting now for six months. And it's someone in New York owns it. Is what I've discovered. So if you, um, I said we were talking about it last night, which is what Rebecca was referring to. But if we, if someone knows who has has it and can introduce me so I can see the painting, I'll buy your coffee. <laughs> is this uh, wallpaper that he that he's collaging, or is this painted? This is the, paint. This is paint. The um the um the the dots. It just seems so unlike Picasso to do dots like that. Yeah, great question. But Braque and Picasso did paint wallpaper. Literally, they, they would put illusionistic effects like that into their cubistic paintings. So they were painted, but, and then later, and they also did collage with, with collage elements. So, so it gets confusing as to, but in the paintings they were painting, um, and Braque was more into it because his father um, did that for a living. So he sort of learned that skill as a kid. Um, and, and brought it into painting, into, into the plastic arts. But 
Um, and Picasso obviously being Picasso copied and everything from everyone and did it better basically. Um, but you know, there's something about the way he uses this blue and it adds up to something, but it's not, he doesn't give it all to you, that thing that it adds up to. And then it's in tension with these other dark, warm, orangey colors, which again add up to something, but you don't get it all, which is in tension with these light, very light creamy colors, which again seem to have some sense to them. And so all these different ideas, these patterns, everything else, which turn planes, it's almost like he, he, um, he's flattening the space, but also making the forms incredibly volumetric at the same time. So they're more volumetric than say, even if we go back to the, the, the Caravaggio, then but maybe they're more volumetric than that. But this, and the space is flatter than the Caravaggio. So, so for a very powerful um, result. So I'd love to see, it's about five and a half feet, six feet tall. So I'm sort of obsessed with it and I wanna see it. And you know, this putting a piece of red, we've talked about this before, that intense red, what it does to the whole. And there's lots of images of this in different states too, by the way. Um, and I don't really know what the actual painting looks like because the images, every image I see has a different sense of the color of, you know, how intense that turquoisey color is. And so I don't really know. That's why I want to see it. But some, someone's got it and I probably go past it on my bike, you know, twice a week and, um, and I don't know it's there. So that's New York for you. But um, the, you know, this putting a little bit of red in is, is what Turner did, you know, it's what Constable did. You know, Turner in the film that we talked about the other day, how we were talking about watching the film. Did anyone get, did anyone have a chance to watch it yet? Not yet. So, you know, he went in at the end and put that dab of red, which became a buoy. And Picasso is in effect doing the same thing. And that's the, um, the spark that ignites the whole. But he has also on top of it a red one. A like, little dollar red, right? Yeah, right. <clears throat> Tiny little moments. Yeah. You know what gets me, Peter? It's Nina. Oh, okay. It's down below on the left where I think it almost looks like a door, like to go into, like depth. Like where? on the left on the bottom. Down here? Yeah, a little bit over. A little bit over where the white part is on the left side. Yeah. Further down, further all the way down on the left. Move over a little bit, Kristen. Yeah, right there. Just I feel like it's a doorway into. Okay. This is nice. It's pretty cool, right? In the yeah. way that works. And then things like that, like that really just goes back into space. Like, you know, it opens up like a bottle of wine over time, like you start to see stuff. Peter, is that what you mean, how he's made it volumetric, or is it the values, white, uh, light to dark? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, Renju. Um, There's certainly it, a full, so, you know, given that we just did that yellow, you know, we all saw David's yeah. yellow painting uh -huh. behind him in the video, so we got to study it for 45 minutes, which was great. and. You know, this painting has a similar range of tones as David's had. You know, from the very light to the very dark, but not every, not a million tones, just sort of seven tones, seven strong tones and some slight half tones. And sometimes they're the same tones, but different hues and different temperatures, you know? So is that, so, what, what's giving it a volume when you compared it to Caravaggio's images, which are... Well, I just, what I noticed is that this is flatter, Ranju. Okay. So in the Caravaggio, I get a sense that I could walk into this painting and, and, you know, this is, if I went to the Met and I was watching an opera, this could be a scene from an opera. And I feel like I could walk and go 25 feet back there. And there's probably is someone dressed in all black. You know how there's those people in all black moving the sets around during the, mm -hmm. the actual performance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see them. And I almost expect to see a couple back there in a Caravaggio painting. 
like it does, it feels like they're on a stage and they're very, the lighting's very controlled from the side. So it's not, the lighting's not coming from within the painting, it's coming from outside the painting. Mm -hmm. And the space is very deep. And yes. it's, cram it's, it's jam crammed with forms. So I mm -hmm. don't get lost in the space, but I'm not able to really move around inside those areas. And I'm, um, but also I'm, you know, those areas serve to allow us to just focus on what's important. And the Picasso is a bit different because everything's lit. So he's, he's taking the opposite approach. Um, now, maybe the light is coming from within in the painting, or maybe it is coming from outside the painting. I'm not 100% sure. I don't get a sense that there's a strong, you know, I'm wondering if the, the light's coming from the side, but I'm not 100% sure. But I feel like I could stick my arm in there, but I'm not sure I could walk in there and stand next to that figure, if that's what that is, you know? Okay. Peter, like did if we were to build this, there wouldn't be much room for us to, to get into that space. Mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Peter, does he make an underdrawing for this? I don't, well, he, you know, I, for this painting, I don't know because I don't know much about it. I've seen him paint big paintings before where he starts with a line drawing with thin paint. So the one that everyone studies the most is Guernica. But I've seen lots of studies for other paintings and he's always drawing and he'd do make lithographs and make etchings and, and he'd work through ideas through many mediums. So, you know, once should that you know, and this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the class when we were talking about David's video is that, you know, the key thing, and I was talking about this to Kirsten before we even started, the key, and Kirsten said the key thing is just to keep making stuff. And, and I think that's the, 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 the important thing is we have, we're chewing away on these ideas, whatever they are, and we don't even know what the ideas are. If they're really big, it's, it, as soon as we sort of say, this is my idea, it almost becomes smaller in that, in that, moment and so it's and it's irrelevant what we say so you know we can talk about our work but who cares at the end of the day because what's going to happen is we're going to die one day and someone's going to come along and look at all our work they're going to look at all of jaffa's work and go my god look at all, look at all this look at all this great work and and they're going to decide and they're going to start arguing with each other and trying to work out what sort of artist she was and what she was into and what she did and and it's if you're a good if you're a really good artist that's never that's never nailed down either it's always we're always talking about rembrandt and mozart and chopin and picasso and matisse no one really knows you know yeah most of um, the artists are uh, famous after they die <laughs> yeah um and, and and not because they weren't didn't have a career but more i think more the the the, the, the the better ones are because their work's really good and it's complex and it's varied um, and there's lots of it. So we get, and so we just get obsessed with working it out. You know what uh, I like about this painting also? I didn't notice it at first. At first, the overall, I, I think the color palette's beautiful, but at first, the overall color palette to me seemed kind of dark. Now it seems extremely bright. And I think that sort of upside down L shape on the, left and on the right that sort of yeah. frame really works almost like as a as a as a wall for me like in the space it actually brings to mind vermeer in a funny way like the light the way he has raking light on the very bright light behind the subject yeah and yeah. i don't know if, if that was picasso's intention but those two shapes to me seem to indicate the environment very clearly like even though it's not definitive like specific it seems to locate the what you're saying it's two figures but it could be buildings though to me but it seems to kind of like uh, frame that whole shape have you ever made a picasso painting ira have i ever made a picasso painting yeah uh, i don't think so um it's fun <laughs> I should we do it <laughs> yes you should do it Colleen's going, oh, for God's sake, I don't want I to did do that. Paul Cezanne. I did Paul Cezanne for you. You mean to um, copy one or to, yeah, yeah, take, copy to one. step into his shoes, like psychologically and just so, kind of, that know, would be I've, good I've made a few late Brock's same size as the originals. 
and they took about six months each. Wow. And, totals, yeah. and um, you know, I mentioned that before, but I've made a bunch of Picassos that are smaller though, just quick, just quick one session ones. And so it's, so I'm not suggesting you go and spend six months on this, but just pick something that, and it's always, it's not, it's always, it's, it's worth doing if you're just excited by an image. So if there's something that excites you, you know, like when you're at a restaurant, if there's something on the menu that excites you, order it. <laughs> and, and you'll, you'll make it, you'll, you'll discover something. You may like, you may like it, you may not, but you'll learn, you know? I and, find and in my, sometimes when I'm doing large charcoal drawings, his painting of Guernica comes to mind, I guess, because it's all in tonals. Yeah. But there's something very strong about that painting that has found a place in my brain, you know, for decades. Yeah. And even though I don't think about it consciously, I think it's, it was so impactful seeing it that it imprinted something in my psyche about shape. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm drawing, I, you know, I almost feel like it's being influenced by that, even though it's, I'm not even thinking about it. The, um, have, but you've never made it though, right? I've never copied it, no. The only painting I, the only, I got into this thing where I, ever I go to the Louvre, there's a painting by uh, Jericho, Raft of the Medusa that I like. Yeah. And I, it became an obsession that it's still to this day, like I always have to do a sketch of it. And at first it was just like trying to see if I could form that without too much detail, the large, all the shapes and the composition of his painting on a small sketchbook to sort of transfer the scale down. Like I thought yeah. it was an amazing challenge. But the more I've looked at the painting, the more I see in it. And you know, I know the painting very well. But that's the only painting I've ever actually uh, uh, drawn from. Yeah. Yeah. The the just there's something about painting, just doing a one session painting from someone. So I would just used to do it when I'd go to a museum and something, you know, click with me. I just get a card from the gift shop, and then just have the card in my studio and make a quick painting. Just some some. I generally do it when I was didn't know what else to do, um, you know, or you know I had a couple of hours to kill on a Friday night or um, when I was a student, I'd do it because we always had to submit works for a Christmas show and that would be for sale for a hundred bucks. So I just knock out four or five of those different things. And I didn't feel bad about, you know, giving them away. But the, um, but interestingly, something always happens like this, a moment where I go, oh, that's like, a, like I'd find, I'd discover a problem that I couldn't work out. And then I'd have to get obsessed about solving that problem. And, you know, I never know what the problem is when I started it. I'm just making a painting. But so I, so the problem would come to me. And weirdly, a friend of mine, I remember looked at some one day and he goes, oh, you're, you're doing Brock, but you're making all the forms really volumetric. That's really interesting. And so, you know, like you don't even know what you're doing. You, you can't help but be yourself at the end of the day. So it's, it's worthwhile. Um, I'm going to look at a couple more because I didn't want to look at everyone else's work. Peter, um, quickly, what was the Picasso, the the title of that painting? And Leaning on a Table. Oh, okay. 1916. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It's, it's, there's always slightly different tape um, interpretations because people translate it and it comes out a little bit different here and there depending on what, what site you're on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a David Park painting, Two Bathers from 56. And um, similar palette again, but you know, I just love the shape, how he's taking the plane of her belly, the plane of her arm, her shoulder blade, the top of her shoulder, her right shoulder, the top plane of her arm. So she's doing warm and cool, warm and cool, warm and cool, the neck, and then the side of her head and just making that one great big bizarre shape right in the center of the painting. And then look at how he resolves that arm, that hand. Pretty interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And then he had to fight to get that temperature shift under there to get that arm to lift up. So he's got this warm color against that cool. And then this has to be 
a little warmer than that, but basically cooler than this to lift up. Mm -hmm. And then he, but it's a, he went a tiny bit green and look what he does to answer that tiny bit of green. So instead of having that white sheet, the white, I guess it's a white towel everywhere behind the figure. And notice he doesn't use the same white every single time. It's a slightly different white, but here he puts it, he makes a pink. And that pink turns the plane, interestingly. So that's like a big solid brick wall, that sheet there. Pretty cool, right? And that's a very important moment of the painting because that's cool and that's cool. And then this is a little bit warmer because it gets a touch yellow. So he's brought in this little bit of yellow coming in. But that moment there where he has the red hand and that pink is very necessary to make all of this and all of this come alive. So um, this is another Caravaggio, again using a sheet for structural reasons to help, you know, control the space, get color flashing across the space, but also to sort of create this great big shape. This is called um, Death of the Virgin. Have you seen this, John? This is in the Louvre. Who's been to the Louvre? Who's seen this in the Louvre? Ira, you Rubens, saw it? Rubens, who wanted. Bonnie, you saw it? I've seen this. What were you going to say, John? I don't remember seeing it, no. There's some strange story about no one liked this painting because the Virgin is a girl from the streets. Right. Rubens convinced the king or something to buy it anyway, because it's such a ma magnificent painting. I don't know. It's one of those little stories. The king may have known her, though. <laughs> There's a good movie about Caravaggio. Uh, I think it was uh, done by a German director, maybe in the 1980s. Yeah. You know okay. I haven't seen that film, no. It's, it's worth it. It's like everybody's, all his cohorts are sort of like wearing leather jackets and stuff and uh, motorcyclists. And uh, I don't know, it's a very good film, mm -hmm. nevertheless, even though it's, you know, a little silly. But, Is it called Caravaggio? Uh, probably. I don't remember, but it's, it's really good. Yeah. I yeah. watched it two days ago. I think we're talking about the same uh, yeah. movie. It's almost uh, contemporary in the, in most of the costumes. Yeah, yeah. And I think the focus is interesting on some of the paintings and two of the uh, the, the two Caraggios we, we've just seen, those are uh, also uh, represented in the movie. It's a very interesting read. It's very theatrical in the way it was uh, oh. made. It's yeah, interesting. And Sarah, it's called, it's called Caravaggio. Si, Caravaggio. Okay. This is a Cezanne from the Barnes. I've got a couple to look at um, quickly. The Cezanne from the Barnes. So I was just sort of tossing around, you know, not succeeding in what I was doing. So sort of tossing around, I thought I'm, I'm going to see how some other people come up with interesting structures and Cezanne's someone I've looked at a lot using fabric as well. Um, and, you know, I observed already that that's, that looks like the nose of his father, of his dad disapprovingly looking out over the, what he's doing. But the, the way he unites the white compotier or the, the white fruit bowl with the fabric. And, you know, as I look at the fabric now, I see Mount Saint Victoire. Hmm. So maybe he was just what we were talking about before. Maybe he was um, working through his ideas many, many ways. So he was perhaps painting Mount Saint Victoire in the landscape and then coming into the studio and setting out Mount Saint Victoire as a still life to give himself the same set of problems and then resolving, you know, ha, you know a, he's able clearly to see the planes and, and break down the form and resolve those issues. Um, and then go out, go back out into the landscape and apply what he's learned to the mountain. Um, so I'll have to think about that a little bit. This is Picasso. Um, still life, lamp when still life. Um, very different, but still using similar um, 
attributes or, or similar devices as Cezanne and some of the earlier people, um, Alice, that we looked at, this table and how he, and the, you know, think of the Caravaggio, how he has that plane flat coming forward and then this plane receding. And then of course, Picasso denies that recession because it'd be too obvious to, to do that. So he has the horizontal going all the way across and then he's got to counteract that. So he, instead of having a diagonal there, he has the exaggerated diagonal there. So he lifts up the table and he um, brings down the side of the table. And then you can get everything moving around. Um, but everything, you know, the whole rectangle is excited and connected and held together by this, um, it's almost like a wrought iron structure that runs through the whole thing. I mean, this is just, this is what Cezanne does there, where Cezanne breaks that edge, which he does because he's looking perceptually, and this happens when we're looking perceptually. And then Picasso does it as a, as, as a uh, almost as a reference to Cezanne. He breaks that edge. I like the way that orange or that peach on the right is on a slant so it would roll off, but he's got something keeping it from rolling off. <laughs> I think that's funny. Right. <laughs> yeah, do you think you thought about that, Sarah? Like, how do I stop that rolling off? I, I think it's a joke. I think. Picasso is often quite funny, and I think it's a little yeah. joke, but maybe I'm wrong. That's Interesting you put this shape spark. in there. Sorry, what was that? I, would, I was just going to say, that's kind of his spark of red, too, isn't it? Like, that's how he ignites. Yeah. So that same sort of thing that you were talking about. Yeah, the about. same thing we noticed in the, in the um, Picasso, and sorry, in the, um, yeah, the Picasso, the man leaning on the table. And we talked about with Turner. Um, look at that shape there. If he put that in last, why do you put that in? Like, is it superfluous or is it necessary? Joanna? It does, it feels like it creates a balance that the picture doesn't tip to one side, the painting doesn't pick, tip to one side. And it makes the side much more interesting. To I also look think at. it take, you know, takes it from a flat, flat, uh, kind of a flat painting to give it dimension. It's almost like the, like only the real, almost like 3D dimension in it that brings that piece forward. Yeah. But does it bring it together because he has the black lines, which are bringing everything together and that from the candle just brings it all in. That it, ties, it ties something together here. I, yeah. yeah, there's like a... To me, um, to me it looks as if the, um, the black diagonal that goes to the corner as if by this extra uh, thing he makes that plane look like it's going down rather than like it's uh, going flat on top, like yeah. closing the space, it opens the space. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't this, know what I explain. This part there, uh, this part there? No, no, all the way next to the candle. Is that, isn't that what you're talking about? The, yeah. the darker, yes. Yeah that he puts that in so that the plane that he creates from the black line that goes to the corner, that that plane looks like one that goes down in the back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than combines with the other black line that goes to the candle and makes it look as if it's sort of like a lid. It's just enough to let this become a different plane to that, right? Right. And so it's, does it, yeah, it'd be great to see this painting in the flesh because I reckon there'd be a spatial, spatial shift, tiny yeah. inferred spatial shift between there and there. Right. But also there's this theme. It's almost like now I'm seeing a Madonna in here somewhere. 
or an angel and the arabesques flow out of her into the rest of the composition. So like it's almost like that mark and that mark are related. Mm -hmm. And then this comes out and over there and this comes out and over there and this comes down, down and out and over there. And this one goes across and then out over there, over there, over there. So it's almost like you can follow every mark all the way around. So he needed something here. Maybe if, if that just flowed into that, it was, it was way too um, repetitive with this maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe he needed this contradictory idea in relation to these blacks that you just mentioned. Anyway, I'm not sure. <laughs>